Marilyn Manson said music is the strongest form of magic. And James Brown certainly enchants and mesmerizes his audience with this primal performance and recording. A recording that almost never was. I said in my little introduction there that this was a recording that almost never was. This album is uh, defined very much by James Brown struggling against his label to help get this realized. It was actually recorded in 1962 on October the 24th. And I must admit, it's not the best quality live recording you'll ever hear, but what it lacks in fidelity, it more than makes up for you in power and performance. James Brown said in his autobiography, I wanted the audience to feel that a James Brown performance was something special. My word, he certainly achieves that. In fact, Rolling Stone has hailed this as one of the greatest live albums ever. James Brown had to lock horns with his label to get this uh, dream of his realized, uh, a label that could see no value in a live recording. In fact, such to the extent that James Brown actually had to pay for this himself. It cost him $5,700, which is a, a princely sum way back in 1962, I can assure you. But maybe he just took all the money out of those fines that he was imposing upon the famous flames for turning up to gigs with their shoes scuffed or, or something like that. Brown's label at the time were King Records. Now, King Records uh, was established in 1943 by Sid Nathan. Now, the label was opposed to the very idea of a live album. It could see no value in something that wasn't new songs um, and just would not perhaps would not be profitable and they could just see no point in it and they certainly didn't want to see James Brown hoisted on the petard of his own foolishness for them it was all about the material for James Brown it was all about the performance nevertheless the label did finally relent under increasing pressure from uh, Brown himself and his manager the label were forced to wolf down a huge dollop of humble pie when this record did so, so well, spending like 66 weeks on the Billboard charts, peaking at number two. The only reason it didn't get to number one is it was prevented from doing so by uh, Andy Williams' The Days of Wine and Roses. If we think about the recording itself, the deluxe edition comes with the announcement. I don't think in the, the announcement was on the original. I could be wrong there. But the announcement was made by Fats Gonda who proceeds to uh, loosen the panties and raise expectations of the first five rows of the audience. And he does it in one fell swoop uh, as the crowd is lifted to a pre-show, almost pre-orgasmic swoon. He also throws out several uh, James Brown epithets at the time, the hardest working man in show business, perhaps one of the most famous ones, before running off a whole uh, litany or list of James Brown's hits just to get the audience salivating. Each announcement uh, greeted with this whoosh and shrill of female voices. Perhaps a bit of a precursor to the the hysteria that would greet the Fab Four when they first appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show in 1964. The famous Flames, of course, Brown's backing band. Uh, a bit of a, rev a revolving door there, I think, as many of them probably got a little bit cheesed off with Brown's obsession and um, obsession with detail, every minor little detail as well as the the fact that he brought in a system of fines every time they didn't perform well hit a bum note turned up with a mark on their shirt uh, another fine so gosh he must have been popular but the famous flames on this album consists of bobby bird bobby bennett and lloyd stolworth um of course the famous flames would be disbanded altogether a bit later on this record is barely half an hour long um, it, and certainly it is almost incomparable to those live monoliths we used to get in the 1970s. It's all about power and impact. Perhaps slightly uh, reminds me of The Who, Live at Leeds, the original issue of that album. But this is now that broadens his uh, James Brown's appeal, in my opinion. I think in his autobiography he talks about uh, him increasingly appealing to whiter audiences after this album comes out. It certainly helps to establish him as, as one of the the four foremost R&B artists of the time. Of course, he starts to get all funky a bit later on, but this album shows Brown at his uh, most incendiary in terms of a live performer, but also at his most soulful. Interesting, he defines um, soul as nothing more than uh, a kind of a merging of gospel and R&B. MC5 guitarist Wayne Kramer said, Live at the Apollo was a huge influence on Kick Out the Jams. In fact, we'd sit down and listen to it 
on repeat whilst taking acid. But nevertheless, it's an album, as I said earlier, that the, the fidelity of it is not that perfect, but it's certainly an early, early live album. There's no doubt about that. In fact, James Brown said of recording this album, Mr. Neely sent words uh, that he wanted us to use cue cards to direct the audience participation. I said, now, if you're all gonna pay for it, then I'll do it the way you want to. But if I'm going to pay for it, then please leave it alone. All I want you to do is tape the stuff and record it. They did borrowing sound equipment from A1 Sound in New York. The plan was to record four shows. They had eight mics uh, recording Brown, the famous Flames, and of course the audience. Brown was incredibly nervous, and not so much about the, his ability to perform, but uh, the possibility of that performance not being caught correctly on the recordings. He's invested so much of his reputation and money into this album. Interestingly, he talks about the recording, uh, him performing in a slightly different way than he would or ordinarily do so, letting out more screams and prompts, uh, probably due to his anxiety uh, about what was, uh, what was going to come across well. Uh, even during the audience, uh, at one point, uh, I think he says one woman lets out this loud scream, which he was worried perhaps ruined the recording. And in fact, if you listen to the album, he said, I, I thought, well, there goes that song too. Then I thought a better way to try and fix it, some kind of way. So I started preaching. He, I said, you know, we all make mistakes sometimes. And the only way we can correct our mistakes is we've got to try it one more time. So he then repeats the song. So I get, uh, so I stretched out the song, hoping we'd get something we could use. And I went into, please. Of course, when they got back the recording uh, of the first night, the, um, there was a, a woman that was picked up prominently on the microphone screaming, um, sing it, motherfucker, or something like that. Um, uh, Mr. Neely, who said, uh, obviously when he, he heard the recording, said, oh, obviously we can't have that, and hoped, obviously, they'd get a, a better and cleaner recording for the next three nights. It seems like the rest of the band uh, eventually just thought her, her response was incredibly funny and decided that they, um, in the end, felt that she actually added to the performance and actually bribed her and gave her 10 bucks and all the popcorn she could eat if she came to the subsequent uh, three performances after that one. They just shifted the microphone slightly so she wasn't so prominent on it. But it's this wonderful symbiosis with the between performer and audience that makes this live recording so special, in my opinion. And James Brown obviously understood that as well. In fact, he says that uh, I even tried to find the woman who'd done all the screaming and cussing just to thank her, but she just couldn't be found. But nevertheless, she screams and cusses her way into music history. This album is a, a beautiful snapshot. It's a historical document as far as I'm concerned. Uh, he did go on to record subsequent albums at the Apollo as well, um, obviously capitalizing on the success of this one. But I'm not sure any of them capture the, they may be, they may sound better, but I don't think any of them caught the sheer primal energy and uh, presence that this album has. Anyway, I'd like to thank you for watching that. I hope you've all got a copy of your James Brown Live at the Apollo that you're going to shuffle away and listen to now. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for being patrons. And I'll leave you with my closing salvo, which as you know is hope you're staying well, healthy, but more importantly that you keep listening.